So we are looking today at seeing the unseen. It's about, well, it's about faith, yes, and hope, but um, longevity as well, um, sticking with the faith, continuing on the upward path, and uh, I suppose this is uh, something of a return to basics about the faith, and that is a good thing sometimes. I hope that it will be helpful to you. I'm genuinely concerned for the souls of the church here. I hope that everybody makes it to heaven in the last day and we help each other. So let's do this. Seeing the unseen uh, begins at 2 Kings chapter 6. With this thought, open his eyes that he may see where the prophet has a servant who is afraid of the army that is surrounding the city, which seems like a reasonable response, but in fact, he's missing something. Second Kings six fourteen through 20, the king of Syria sent horses and chariots and a great army, and they came by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? He said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And this is while Elisha and his servant are at home <laughs> by themselves on a mount outside the city here. But the place is surrounded by an army, and he says, Oh, we've got more than they do. What do you mean? Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, Behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And when the Syrians came down against him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Please strike this people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness, in accordance with the prayer of Elisha, who is a man with a nature like ours. And Elisha said to them, This is not the way, this is not the city. Follow me, I'll bring you to the man whom you seek. And led them into Samaria, the capital of Israel. As soon as they entered Samaria, Elisha said, O Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. Which means their number was up. <laughs> They're done for. They were not destroyed, though. God sent them back another way and subdued them, and they never raided Israel again, at least not during the days of that king and prophet. But... Um, I want to look again at this and notice this young man looks around and sees the large forces and Elisha says don't be afraid in a situation where everybody would probably be scared <laughs> two of you in a house and an entire army has surrounded you but he said those who are with us are more than those who are with them which doesn't immediately make sense to the young man, you know, if he's just using his eyes to see, well, there's nobody else here. Certainly not enough room for a force of that size inside this house, right? But Elisha prayed, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And I think that's the important thing. You, you know, he had eyes. He was seeing all around him, but he was just seeing the, this world, the physical things, the odds, if you like. Instead of looking by faith, the way that Elisha encouraged him to do. So the Lord opened his eyes and he saw the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Meaning the force that Elisha has because of the Lord God on his side, if you will, is far greater than anything humankind brings up against him. He has more than enough power by means of the support of God to overcome and to be unafraid. And this is the way that we are supposed to live as Christians, knowing that we are serving that God, the God of the universe, and that there is great power at his disposal. 
even though we may be small or weak or whatever that seems to be. And Elisha said, strike them with blindness, which is an interesting thing because they also thought that they could see <laughs> and really couldn't. Now they literally can't see, and he leads them to their death, if you will, into the uh, city where they don't die, actually, but they could have. But that prayer was answered, and then the prayer to open their eyes was answered, and they realized where they were. All of that to say that there are unseen things there. The servant was not seeing the unseen, didn't realize that God was with them. And perhaps we think that way too sometimes, is what I'm getting at. Now in John chapter 9, Jesus said that he came so that those who don't see may see. John 9, Jesus passing by saw a man blind from birth. And in verse 6, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva and anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. which he did, and washed, and came back seeing. Later, after everything else that happens here, in 39, Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. What does this mean? Is it double speak? No, it's a parable, right? But it's the same as what we read with Elisha and his servant. The servant had eyes. But there was something else that he needed to see, something he needed to realize and understand. But Jesus also is here for judgment, meaning a distinction to be drawn here. There are those who do not see that, be, that learn how to see in Jesus. There are those um, who think that they see or think that they know and they become blind. Specifically, some of the Pharisees nearby heard him say this and said, are we blind too? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. Now that you say we see, your guilt remains. Well, in this case, the vision is not governed by the eyes. The vision is governed by the heart. That's what you're finding out. They see with the heart or they don't. So Jesus said, I came so that those who haven't got sight may have it. He's helping those of us who realize our estate, our um, sins before God. And that those who refuse to obey, refuse to humble themselves, will be made blind. They'll be treated like those soldiers were treated in the account about Elisha. I'm going to keep going here. We look to things unseen, which is in 2 Corinthians 4 and 5, which I found to be, um, and of course it's the same passage and it's contiguous, but he seems to repeat himself and that can be useful. We look to things unseen. 2 Corinthians 4 16 through 18 is the first one, and then we'll look at 5. But he said, we don't lose heart. Even though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. This light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. The things that are seen are transient. The things that are unseen are eternal. Transient meaning passing, just passing through. We look not to things that are seen, but to things that are unseen. What is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal. And that has to be kept in mind, that 
whatever we are doing here is temporary. And the things that are spiritual in nature, the, the judgment of God, the heaven and the hell, are eternal. Those are what's going to be real, if you will. Uh, things are no less real because they are spiritual. I would say they are more real because what we're doing here is temporary. Uh, again, he said, the outer self may be wasting away, but we don't lose heart. And this is true. We serve God and we pay a price and, and things can be difficult and you lose things over time, but don't lose heart. The inner self is renewed day by day, meaning through our spiritual work before God, through our prayers, through our dedication to his word, we can be renewed every day on the inside. And what is this life? It is a light, momentary affliction preparing a heavy, eternal glory beyond all comparison. So there is a light, momentary affliction this world is called. This life is called a light, momentary affliction as opposed to the heavy or the weighty eternity, the eternal glory. It's not affliction. It's not momentary. It's glory, it's eternal, and it's not light, it's weighty. So yeah, what he's getting at is that our term <laughs> in the flesh is relatively short in order to obtain something that is forever. It's a good deal, in other words. <laughs> and in the fifth chapter, you read verses 6 through 10, we're always of good courage. We know while we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord because we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we're of good courage and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether it's good or whether it's evil. So again, you see, they're always of good courage. While we're still here on earth, we walk by faith, not by sight. And in good courage, we'd rather be away from the body at home with the Lord. Meaning we recognize that this life is not the end-all be-all. This is not the place where you want to stay. Where you want to be is in heaven with the Lord. That's better than whatever is happening here. However good it might be. But one way or the other, the goal is to please him. Because we will appear before that judgment seat and we will give an answer for what we have done. Everybody will receive an, uh, what is due for what has been done in the body. You, there's not another chance when you're done with the body and you go on to eternity. You don't get an opportunity then to try to do something about this. That doesn't work that way. You have to do it now. You have to do it today. This is the proving ground. But the two things compare... Uh, chapter 4 and chapter 5. In 4 he had said we don't lose heart. In 5 he said we're always of good courage. I would think that's something that you want for yourself, right? <laughs> As a child of God, don't you want to be the one who is not losing heart? The one who is of good courage? Instead of afraid of everything and every time and every problem? Be of good courage. Be strong in the Lord. Um, I always think about the uh, quotation attributed to Mark Twain, which probably is not even true, as most things attributed to Mark Twain are not. But he said, I've worried about many things in life, and some of them have even happened. 
that's true. You don't need to worry about it. Jesus said, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. That's true. Living in the past is depression. Living in the future is anxiety. But today is the day of salvation. So we don't lose heart. We're of good courage. Why? This is why, because we look not at things that are seen, but at things that are unseen. We walk by faith, not by sight. And that's an important thing because when you look at what is seen, <laughs> when you use sight instead of faith, it looks bad. It looks bad. That's the problem. The odds are always against you when you are a child of God, uh, whatever it might be. Our numbers are small. Our, our strength is uh, small, right? Um in another place in sec in uh, first corinthians he had said you can see your calling not many high and mighty not many noble true the church is not made of society's leaders world's champions uh, captains of industry some of those people do obey the gospel but as a rule that's not what this is made out of um you know how many of them are wealthy how, how many you know, have advanced degrees, how many, you know, it's just not what the church is made out of as a rule. So whatever things, uh, organizations, human organizations look for to uh, attract talent to themselves, to, to grow or to accomplish their mission, the church doesn't have those things. That's not how we succeed. Because the battle is the Lord's. Israel's mil military strategy was neither. It was trust in God, be right with God, and he will protect you. That's how you do it. You want not to lose heart. Well, you are going to lose heart if you look at what is seen. If you're counting on things, you know, that can be counted, you will lose heart. People will let you down. Um, numbers will go down. Uh, like we said, things stop working as time goes on. Walk by faith, not by sight, and you can have good courage. And how many accounts in the Old Testament do you see where the people were discouraged, where they became fearful and cowardly because they were not thinking about God fighting the battle for them. They were thinking about what they could see in front of them and whether they could take it. Well, you can't. You know, the devil will always come to you with a force that you cannot take. You have to rely on the Lord. But you can rely on him and he is reliable. Everything in the scripture shows you that he is. So yes, I do, um, you know, I do have a genuine concern for everybody not to lose heart, not to be discouraged, but understand that uh, God is the one whom we serve God is the one whom we please and and people think what they think it's kind of irrelevant what does God say that's the thing that matters and as long as we are faithful to him he will preserve us and, and he will keep us and this will our effort to serve him it will succeed Maybe it won't meet the metrics of man's measures of success, but it will succeed in the thing for which he sent it. Now, you knew we had to go to Hebrews 11 with faith, and I will do that. But think about this with me for a bit in a new, uh, in a new light. I'll try to do that. In Hebrews 11, one faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And I sure wish that they had translated this passage. But this is what we'll have to work with. <laughs> and it gets worse if you go back in time from ESV to some of the other ones. Um, what is faith? The assurance of things hoped for, conviction of things not seen. What does that mean? Well, uh, first of all, faith as a word means trust. 
actually. It's trust. Um, I mean, that's the the you know the real meaning. If if we were doing a translation today, we would not use the word faith, and we would not use the word believe. We would use trust, because that's what it means. You trust God. This is just a, a dictionary definition, actually. Trust is assurance of things hoped for. Assurance meaning the thing is substantive. The thing is real. It, it has a form. It has a nature. So it's saying... It's defining the word trust. If there's something that you are hoping for, well, you don't hope for something you see. You hope for something you don't see. Romans 8, right? If there's something that you're hoping for, but that thing is real, substantive, actually has a, a natural form. Well, that's trust. As in, you know that it's there. That's what that means. You trust because you know that it's there, even though you haven't seen it. That's all. This is just the dictionary definition here in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Okay, that's the first thing. Let's talk about that for a bit. Assurance. Which is sometimes rendered, like I said, a, a natural form or uh, the nature of something as in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, where Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. That's his assurance in Hebrews uh, 11, <laughs> 1. <laughs> well, no, his nature. And this word actually, um, in, in the original language, uh, is a very literal word for... Uh, what settles at the bottom in a liquid. So it would be like sediment. Or, for those of you who are into cooking, jelly or thickener in a soup, right? You know how that liquid quickly um, is reduced to its substance, right? The, the hard things that are in it. Maybe you'd say substrate, even. Because foundation or substructure is another meaning here. Um, but it's the substantial nature, the actual existence, the reality of the thing. It's the opposite of the appearance or semblance or fantasy of a thing. It's the real thing, not the appearance of a thing. <laughs> well, this is the meaning of it. When we say that God, that Jesus is the radiance of his glory, the exact imprint of his nature, we mean his, his existence, his reality, not his semblance or fantasy, the real thing, the substance that, that there is to this, whatever solids are in it. The same is true at Hebrews 3.14, where it is rendered confidence. We've come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. And uh, our sister Judy pointed this out to us today in Bible class. And I did not I had not shared the sermon with her ahead of time. She's just that that sharp. So uh, it's true. This confidence is the same word as Hebrews 11 1. Faith is the confidence of things hoped for that'd be a better translation wouldn't it that makes sense you're confident that the thing you hope for is real that's what trust is and the other thing it says is the conviction of things unseen conviction is used in other places for example john 3 verse 20 where it is used in a way that is more conventional. Whoever does wicked things hates the light and doesn't come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. That exposure uh, is the meaning of conviction. 
literally is an argument of disproof or refutation. It's cross-examination, scrutiny, testing. That's the meaning of that word. So those who do what is wicked hate the light and don't come to the light because they do not wish to be cross-examined. They do not wish to be scrutinized. That's what it means when you shed light on it. Right? We use these things in English all the time. Um, John 8, 46, Jesus said, Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why don't you believe me? There's no conviction of sin in Jesus. No, nobody can prove or demonstrate by scrutiny, testing, or cross-examination that he has sinned in any way. He hasn't. So, again, when, you know, what Hebrews 1, 11, 1 says, the conviction of things not seen, meaning it's the proof, the testing um, that yields this result. There are things not seen. They are real. They are there. There's rationale. There's reason for this. We know that it's there. Okay, so trust, right, is that confidence of the thing you hope for. That uh, maybe the assurance uh, that of things unseen. Right, but the, the indication, the, the scrutiny, the testing, the examination yields the result that there are things unseen. They are real. That's what it means. This is trust. And sometimes um, I've used, I, I keep using it. I think it's right is why I keep using it. There's an illustration, which is um, if somebody says that they have gotten you tickets to some location that you want to go to on an airplane, um and that those tickets will be waiting for you at the counter on the day of the flight. Um, if you believe that person, if you trust that person, then the thing you hope for is the tickets, right? And you're, if you trust them, then you believe those are real. This is not a scam. There really are tickets. Conviction of things not seen. Well, how are you going to get them? Well, we're going to get them at the at the ticket counter. That makes sense. That's what people do. Whenever tickets are held, that's where they get held. So you go there and you're going to get them, right? You don't see them, though. You haven't seen the receipt. You haven't seen... No, you haven't seen them, but you trust that person. Well, why do you trust that person? Aha, see, now you're thinking like Satan. <laughs> well, God knows that the day you eat of it... Your eyes will be open. He's holding out on you, man. That's the devil. Why do you trust God? But see, if you trust that person, then yeah. What does it mean to believe that the tickets are there? Well, it means you take off at work. Right? And you pack your bags and your bags are packed with things that are appropriate for the weather and the location you're planning to go to, right? That's what it looks like. And you get a ride and you show up at the time and the place with everything ready to get on the airplane. The only thing missing is the tickets, but you believe that person, you trust that person, you put your faith in them, and so you're getting on. That's, you know, literally all that Hebrews 11 is trying to say. Just defining the term. Trust in God is being sure that the things that we hope for are real things. And having reason for that, too, though they have not been seen. That's all. That's what it is to trust in God. So again, it's not that we have this blind trust that he's going to do some miracle or is going to save, you know, outside of any, anything that we do or any role that we play, that's not biblical. That's not biblical. It's a reasoned faith, a convicted faith. There's reason to believe that God will deliver as he said, that things are as he says that they are. That's coming to us by way of the scriptures. So I 
need to get back to where I was. Here we are. Hebrews 11 verse 3 said, By faith we understand the world or the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. This word understand is an interesting word because it primarily means to perceive with your eyes, to observe, to see. But it is used metaphorically for perceiving in the mind, for apprehending a thing, right? So that's an interesting, an interesting word. It is by means of our trust in God that we come to understand the universe was created by the word of God. What is seen was not made out of things that are visible. I, I think this verse is very important when it comes to questions about how the Lord made the earth or how the questions about the creation or the creation account. This verse is very important because understanding in that matter comes by faith, not by sight. What you can see is not necessarily a reliable record. What we know by trust in God is that his word is the means by which everything was created. And so things that we now see were not made out of things that can be seen. They were made at his word. Right, so in Matthew 16, um, which I think we also referred to in our class today, Jesus upbraids the disciples because he's trying to teach them about the spread of the doctrine of the Pharisees by comparing it to yeast, leaven. And they don't get it. He said, do you not yet perceive? Do you not remember the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets you gathered? And the 11th verse, how is it you fail to understand? I didn't speak about bread. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They're, the perception, the understanding, right? putting two and two together, drawing conclusions from what you're seeing. That's how we understand that the world was made through the word of God. And also Romans 1.20, God's invisible attributes, eternal power, divine nature have been clearly understood or perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So again, you can look around at the earth, you can look at the times, the cycles, the seasons, the glory of the heavens, so many things that tell you there must be God. He must be eternal. He must be divine in nature. He must have power greater than this universe. He must be timeless since time is a physical dimension. This is what it means to understand by faith, by trust. Only when you trust that what God said is true, do you understand it. That's the point. And it's what you'll see later, you know, where Abraham offers Isaac by faith because he reckoned God could raise him from the dead. That's an understanding based on facts. The conviction of things unseen, right? That cross-examination, that scrutiny, the argument. There's reason for it. It's not an unreasoned thing. It's not a blind faith. And finally, Hebrews 11, 7, Noah, warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of the household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. So again, because Noah trusted what God told him, he constructed an ark and saved his house. What did God tell him? Well, he was warned about events as yet unseen. What we know about that time is very little, but it seems to be the case that it had never rained before. Um, you know, there hadn't been whatever else happened. They talked about the earth splitting, the rocks splitting, the oceans uh, opening. Um, you know, this is all consistent with some kind of explosion, some kind of huge impact from a meteor, whatever. 
the idea being that, yes, a whole bunch of things that nobody had observed before are what God told him was going to happen, and he trusted God where nobody else trusted. Nobody else got on that ark except for his family. But because he believed God and had been warned, even though that was something he had never seen before, he believed that that was real and that was coming. And so he, in reverent fear, constructed an ark. And you know they came by, you know, and mocked him. There's crazy old man Noah <laughs> still building that ark, huh? <laughs> you know, a hundred years he was doing that. But yes, because he believed God. By which he condemned the world, became an heir of righteousness by faith. It comes by faith. So this comes back to us again. You know, if you want to be right with the Lord, if you want to be an heir of righteousness that comes by trust in God, then you will have to be moved by reverent fear. And you will have to construct an ark as well, not literally, metaphorically. You have to take up, you know, deny the self and take up the cross and follow him daily. You'll have to sacrifice, you have to give, but it's well worth it. This is a light and momentary affliction compared to what is coming. Eternity is the most important thing that there is. Your eternal, your eternal soul is the most precious thing that you own. In some sense of ownership, <laughs> we all belong to God, but you have free will. You can choose to serve him or you can choose not to. It's the most important thing that there is. And uh, so, you know, you got to take a little inventory and ask, I mean, is it the most important thing or not? I mean, I say it's the most important thing, but really, is it the most important thing? Does it come first when you're budgeting? Does it come first when uh, you're giving? Does it come first when you're scheduling? Um, you know, what is, what is the real status of this? Where is your faith? Your faith can be seen, and if it can't be seen, it's not faith. And you can say, oh, yeah, I believe the guy that got me the tickets, but where are your bags? Oh, well, you know, I just, you just what? You trust him or you don't, that's all. If you trust him, you got bags. Right, the group going one way, went man walking the other way, the man says, where are you guys going? They said, well, we're going to pray for rain. And he said, well, where are your umbrellas? And they said, oh, yeah, hmm. Well, what do you think is going to happen? I mean, truly, why? What do you think this is about? What is important? What is more important than this? I mean, I say these are uh, genuine thoughts and concerns that we have to, we've got to put God first. We have to place an emphasis on the service and the work of the Lord. And there's plenty of need. There are plenty of needs that need to be met in the, in the congregation. There's lots of good to be done. God has blessed us with many things that we can share and we can use to help each other. But you'll only do that if you're seeing the unseen. If you realize there is a hereafter, there is a, a judgment, there is something that's worth more than everything here. So, I don't know, think about it. But do, you know, leave off the world leave off sin as Noah condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. You also can become an heir of the righteousness that is by faith. That's the end of that. Today, are you a child of God? Are you a Christian? Today is the day of salvation. Do you believe that God can save? Do you believe that God can raise the dead? Because he has done so. He raised his son Jesus from the grave that you and I might be forgiven. He died instead of us when we deserve to die because of what we've done. <coughs> that he died instead. And God will forgive us in him. So if you believe in Jesus and you haven't 
put him on in baptism for forgiveness of sins. Well, you haven't put to death the old person. You haven't um, participated in his resurrection. You don't have the hope of eternal life with God. If you realize that those things are real and that they are coming, well, you, you need to prepare. Today, if you're already a Christian, but have not been living by the strength that you ought to, let us pray that you may be strengthened that you might have the faith that is necessary to overcome in this life, the endurance that is necessary, and hold fast our confidence firm to the end. If you need our prayers, if you need to be baptized, let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing.